Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Last night was the celebration of the Mihraj. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, it is also known as the night visit or the time that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was taken from a rock in Jerusalem to heaven uh, on the wings of a winged horse whose name was Barak. And in that visit, one of the things <clears throat> that occurred was the protocol was established for prayer. And five times prayer was established in the heavens and then brought back down to earth when uh, the prophet came back to earth. Now, the, the formal prayer consists of a series of two to four rakats. And a rakat is a repetition of uh, the first surah, the Fatiha, another surah, a certain bowing, standing, sitting, and then doing that again, and the recitation of certain words uh, during each phase. It is very important that we are cognizant of what the words that are being said mean and what the words that are being said represent. We begin with the first surah in the Quran, the Fatiha, which establishes our primacy uh, in our relationship with God at, as that being the prime relationship, and of course establishing the primacy of God, of Allah, as the one God and the one that we trust in. Then another surah is said from the Quran, uh, then we do some praise, and then we sit. And we sit twice. In the second, in the first sitting, we do a portion of the recitation that's done while sitting. But in the, in the final sitting, we do the whole recitation. And the entire recitation uh, in English is, or in Arabic, is the script of what was said upon the Prophet's arrival in heaven. So, imagine, the Prophet arrives in heaven, and he says, all praise and praising and all forms of worship are to God alone. And then the angels respond to the Prophet, uh, greetings, and may peace and blessings be upon you. And he responds back, May peace and blessings be upon all of us. And they respond back, And we acknowledge that God is one, God is God, and you are the prophet of God. And then they say, And may there be peace and blessings on the prophet, and his offspring, just as there have been peace and blessings upon Abraham and his offspring. And that's said twice in two different ways. Now, imagine yourself in that scenario. You're reading the script of what happened in heaven during the night journey. And your prayer, when you do it, a large portion of the prayer is a repetition of that script. 
So, we need to mentally place ourselves into the night journey every time we pray. We need to place ourselves as if we were coming to the angels and being stood before Allah every time we pray. And we have to prepare ourselves for that meeting just as the Prophet was prepared for that meeting. So, in the morning, we begin the morning by doing what? Going to God, meeting with the angels, and having an encounter with Allah. And then in the afternoon, what happens? We go to God and have an encounter with the angels. And then mid-afternoon, and then prior to sunset, and then in the evening. So five times a day, we have basically been told to prepare ourselves to go on mihraj. mihraj. Now, whether we go or not, we'll see. But this is the preparation for that. And can we do that in this existence? Can we prepare ourselves to go on that journey towards Allah as the Prophet went on that journey towards Allah? So when in Sufism we talk about becoming pure, uh, taking on God's qualities, becoming uh, without blemish, letting go of all the qualities that are not with Allah. What's the reasoning for this? What's the main purpose for this? Where does this all take us? Well, it takes us to this meeting with Allah, because either we are prepared for this meeting with Allah, or we are not prepared for this meeting with Allah. Imagine the purity it takes to get by the angels. Imagine the purity it takes to be set before the Lord. Imagine what is allowed before the Lord. Um, a sheikh like our Sheikh Muhammad Rahim Baal Muhayyadeen, would not go into certain places. Why? Because they would denigrate his state. He would not involve himself in certain things. Why? Because they would denigrate his state. And it was necessary for him to maintain the level of his state on a constant basis. Now, why? Because he was always ready to place himself in the situation where there would be an encounter with Allah. Are we conscious of the fact that we need to put ourselves in situations where we are ready to encounter Allah at any moment. Are we ready for that situation? What have we done to prepare ourselves for that situation? When you ask the question, why should you take on the qualities of Allah? The answer is so that you can be ready for Allah. We can only be ready for Him if we are like Him. We can only be in communion with Him 
if we are like him. We can only be worthy of him if we are like him. He is the standard. And for us to meet that standard, we have to become like him and we have to give up that which is not like him. So we need to go through the purification process. And we have lots of things within us that need to be purified. But God has sent us that which will help us to be purified. And that's the zikr, the remembrance of Allah. If we truly understand the nature of the repetition of these words, we will understand that they are like a light or like a fire that burns from us that which isn't pure. Rahman and Rahim cannot abide anger and jealousy. They can't exist together. But the animals in us, the nefs in us, cannot abide that light and that fire. Animals, when there's a fire, automatically run. So when we are presented with the fire that is the purification, the animals within us will begin to run. And if we identify with the animals within us, we will run also. So we have to break that identity with the lower portions of ourselves so that when we stand before the fire of purification we let the animals run and we stand still and then when we are free of them then the purity that we were meant to be will in fact occur within us and we will become pure. We will become innocent. But in fact, we will become truly innocent, not some sort of make-believe innocence, not some sort of rationalized innocence. And that's why when we do the Salat, and we come to the point where we say, Atakiyatu lilahi wa salawatu wa tayabatu. We have to be cognizant that these are the words that the Prophet first said when he entered the realm of the angels, when he entered the realm of heaven. And we, in fact, are going with him and entering the realm of the angels and entering the realm of heaven. Now, imagine for yourself what is going on within you in the world, and then imagine yourself entering the realm of the angels and the realm of heaven. Imagine the change. Imagine what is been holding you in place in the world, what's been troubling you in the world, what's been making you do all the things that you do in the world, and then all of a sudden you're transposed, transpositioned into the world of the angels, into the world of heaven, at the doorway, at the threshold to Allah. Where does that put you in relationship to all that has been making you crazy in the world? What does it do to the importance of all of the things that have pushed 
and pulled you? What does it do to your understanding of the reality of all of the things that have been pushing and pulling you when you come to that pure state? So, every time we do Salat, we have to begin by saying to ourselves, we are about to enter the realm of divinity. And to enter the realm of divinity, we must be pure. We must be relieved of the burdens of the world because purity is without attachment to the dunya. And that's the way we should think of our five times prayer. It is this immense opportunity to leave the world and enter the realm of divinity. Enter into the state where now we encounter the angels and then the angels make us ready for the encounter with Allah. Imagine that state and become that state. This is the meditation that should form the intention before the prayer. Ali said, every time I pray, I pray as if I were to see God. And this is the reason, because we are establishing the protocol for entering into the divine. We are following the protocol for entering into the divine. We've been given that protocol, and now we have to take part in it. Now, what happens is that if we are distracted, if we are thinking about other things when we enter into prayer, we miss the meaning, and we don't connect to the meaning of the words we say. They just become repeated by us as if we were reciting the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, L, M, P, Q, R, S, T, Allahu Akbar. M, S, R, S, Allahu Akbar. And that's what the prayer becomes. It becomes a rote repetition. Three times three is nine. Three times four is twelve. Three times five is fifteen. Three times six is eighteen. Allahu Akbar. We can't do that. Yet we all know how easy it is to slip into that. And the point is that that's where the effort has to come into play. Consciousness has to say, I have to be aware of what I'm saying. I have to be aware of the place where I am attempting to go. I have to be aware of the station that I'm trying to create. I have to be aware of the scenario that I am now playing. You see, the world is a stage. And we all have scripts. Now, in heaven, there was a situation where the prophet went, and there was a script written down as to what happened. And now, we are each given that script in order to allow the same thing to happen for each of us. And either we connect with the script and become at one with the script, like a good actor, or we just repeat our lines without meaning, like a bad actor. Now, the difference between this and all the other acts is that this act can become reality 
if we focus sufficiently on the nature of it. And then it's no longer an act. It's who we are, and it's what we go through, and it's what we become. And this is the opportunity that the prayer gives us. And this is the celebration that went on yesterday. The fact that Allah laid out for all humanity this opportunity for encounter with Him in daily life. That Allah laid out the protocol for encounter with Him in daily life. Now, once we understand the nature of that encounter, then the question is, do we want to have that encounter? <clears throat> you may remember when our sheikh was here, that there were people who would never go into his room. They didn't want to see him. They didn't want to be confronted by him. And there were lots of reasons that that happened. Some of them were afraid because he, they knew that he would see who they were. Well, it's true. He did see who they were. And it's also true that God will see who you are. But the truth is that whether you go into God's room or in the Sheikh's room or not, they still know going into the room <laughs> is not the operative factor of whether they know or not. Wherever you are, they know. So when you come to the realization that whether you make that effort to go or you try to stay hidden, you're not hidden. Everything that you think is hidden is that which keeps you from getting closer to Allah. Everything you think you're hiding is what keeps you from getting closer to Allah. We all go through these silly games of we're hiding ourselves, or this is not known by anybody else, or this is our deep hidden secret. There are no deep hidden secrets. Everything is an open book. Everything is the headline in the newspaper. Everything is absolutely out front. And so we need to become transparent. And as other people can look through us, we can then be able to see reality. God is transparent. <clears throat> he has no form. He has no physicality. We have physicality, but we also have blocked consciousness. <clears throat> can we have transparent consciousness. When our consciousness becomes transparent, we're ready for that encounter. Because everything that we bring with us that is a block or a veil or a physicality will be burned in that encounter. Or will stop us from having that encounter. So we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at the innocence that we profess about ourselves. <clears throat> and we need to understand that the rationalization that we make towards ourselves is not good enough. We have to confront the truth. The story of Joseph, which I told last week, is such a powerful story of the recognition of truth. Joseph's brothers were before him looking to bring food back to their father because of the famine. And now Joseph controlled Egypt and controlled 
the abundance that was in Egypt. His brothers didn't know that he was the one who was now at the head of the Egyptian abundance, and they had basically forgotten or put away from their minds that they had sold him into slavery, and that when this happened, they had given a receipt in their language for him. And when they stood before him, they proclaimed that they were poor people who came from Canaan and came only for food. And he had planted various objects that were worth money into their saddlebags. And he said, but look what's in your saddlebags. You've stolen all these things. And they said, we haven't stolen anything. We don't know how they got there. We are innocent. We are the most innocent people you can imagine. We have never done anything. We are pure. We spent our life trying to become cleansed of all transgressions. And he said, well, let me think about it. But I have this note that I've been had with me for a while that's in the Hebrew language, and I can't read it. Could you read it for me? And he handed them the receipt for when he was sold into slavery. And at that moment, the overwhelming guilt that they had came over them. And they understood no matter how much they professed their innocence, they weren't innocent. We can profess our innocence, but are we innocent? What has happened to us? What have we gone through? What do we need in order to cleanse ourselves? In the 12-step program in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the exercises they make people do is write down everything that they've done wrong to everybody in their life that they can remember and then go back and apologize and ask for forgiveness from those people. Imagine, this is, this is a, Alcoholics Anonymous is making people go through this. How about the Catholic Church making people go through this? How about the Catholic Church itself going through this? How about each one of us, in every religion, going through that exercise? We need to become pure. Why? For our meeting with Allah. We need to become pure so that when we read the script, we can become that script. This is the intention for humanity. And that's why that night is so important. We are all intended to go to the divine realm. We are all intended to be with the divine. And in order to do that, we must become divine worthy. May Allah allow us all to understand.